to recruit patients with a wide range of cranial dysmorphoses, focusing more on than just traditional cleft palate, as was the focal point for phase phase one. So far, the cases we're taking, we haven't had that much ability to select for cases that involve other craniofacial structures, but you'll see them in a minute. Um, perform the said uh, sequencing and sequence analysis. In 2012, we competed in this international competition to solve cases for which there was genome sequence available, the clarity challenge. We actually won that. So we've built on the computational methods since then to be able to solve these cases efficiently. Um, then uh, lastly, uh, the functional analysis. So uh, in case ascertainment, we're really picking cases that are one-offs, largely. Uh, obviously, if these are cases where we can find multiple independent occurrences of the same gene that's affected, then we don't need to resort to model organism studies. That's the best proof of all. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a large number of these experiments of nature. Obviously, the notion of finding new genes leads to insights into fundamental biology as well as so have ramifications for uh, clinical care of these patients. We pick cases that we are confident we can solve as confident as we can be. We have to have enough individuals, and we're assuming complete penetrance. So cases of murky penetrance, a whole variety of other issues where the inheritance is not clear, we tend to exclude. And then for the time being, we're focused on exomic sequence, primarily coding region mutations, splice sites, and structural variants. Typical analysis will generate a fairly large number, and we filter those in a way which I'll explain to you in a minute. Um, the future for this field is to be able to analyze non-coding variation. Uh, there were some great talks today about that from uh, Dr. Spiesel and uh, Wysaka, and uh, that would be for whole genome uh, sequence as opposed to whole exome sequence. So really focusing on three genetically tractable paradigms. I've talked about this briefly at the kickoff meeting. The best case is a de novo dominant mutation. That means that the mutation arose in the... Uh, offspring for the first time. It's simple if you sequence the three individuals, the trio, you ask what is new in the sequence of the affected proband. There's usually only zero to three variants the way we have our filter set, and you can pretty much get the answer right from that. The next most tractable paradigm are recessive phenotypes, which we can compound heterozygote or homozygote. The particular feature of homozygous mutations comes from Falzon's families in uh, the Middle East where there's a high incidence of consanguinity, about 60%, and that makes it possible to perform homozygosity mapping. And so not only do you uh, have the ability to sequence these individuals, but you know in advance where the candidate regions are likely to reside. And the combined convergence of those two pieces of information yields a high solution rate in these homozygous cases in consanguineous uh, families. And we'll give some examples. The least tractable paradigm is actually counterintuitively the traditional dominant multi-generational inheritance pattern because it generates so many non-synonymous variants in the proband that you can't really limit the number of candidates based on uh, biological and uh, literature principles. The case changes if you have additional family members, and so uh, if we have enough additional family members and they're available, we take on these cases, but otherwise we don't. And there are a number of uh, assumptions here about inheritance, as I said. So. The first aim is really to take cases uh, close by at Boston Children's Hospital and at King Faisal Specialist Hospital Research Center under Falzon's auspices, and he has a program that really encompasses a large part of the Middle East. Um, we'd also like to begin to attract cases from other face-based colleagues, and I know Pedro Sanchez has cases he'd like to send us, and Ophir has approached me about that, but other cases that you know of from your institutions are very eager to hear about. And finally, we have an IRB system that I think allows us to accept cases from other institutions. Uh, there are cases also in the existing phase phase one biorepository. Some of those are actually proving relevant to cases that I will mention. And last but not least, there's a new NIH undiagnosed disease network that will find patients that have undiagnosed diseases. Some of them are craniofacial. And those is another source that, of cases that we can contemplate using. So I'm summarizing cases that we had solved in the past. Many of them were for chromosomal rearrangements. This was as of the last face-based kickoff meeting. The cases up here are ones that we've solved locally. The ones down here are ones that Falzon has solved in the Middle East at King Faisal. 
Most of these were done by exome sequencing or by homozygosity mapping and candidate gene testing in the earlier days. Most of these have been published. Uh, we're still working on a couple of these, and you might recall that I talked about CAPCB, ZEP2, and HEDG4C at the kickoff meeting, and work on those is ongoing. What we've begun to realize is that as you get enough genes, you begin to see connections between them that you wouldn't otherwise have realized. For example, as Eric will talk about in just a minute, CAPZB and SPEC1L seem to interact within the same functional pathway. And more recently, we found that PEZO2 may have a, an ability to interact with the pathway in which CAPZB resides. <coughs> so uh, uh, this is where things stood last uh, time we met. Since then, uh, largely due to Falzon's uh, wonderful work, we've identified five new cases that, uh, for which we have good candidate genes. Uh, the first one here is a case of uh, uh, facies, primary microcephaly, so a small head. You can see that there's allodactyly, characteristic facial appearance. And the gene, I'm calling it King Faisal 1. I, I don't like genetics talks in which the gene is not uh, mentioned, but uh, Falzon, just getting the results, was anxious. They're not proven. They're candidate genes only. Asked that we not uh, talk about what the genes are, except for one example, which we'll come to in a minute. The next one is a case in which this individual has an abnormal craniofacial appearance with very large ears. This is a homozygous truncation in this particular patient. I should mention this is a DNA damage repair gene. This individual had a case of hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, the next one was one in which there is massive hydrocephalus. This gene is a uh, receptor tyrosine kinase that's involved in neuronal pathfinding. Interestingly, it interacts with CRET, which some of you will know is an interact uh, gene that's uh, also mutated with Hirschsprung's disease. It's another case with facial dysmorphism and skeletal dysplasia. The last one I'm going to mention is this uh, myosin binding protein C2, it's a novel gene in a case of Frank Terhar or FTH syndrome. The key features of that are shown here involves brachiocephaly, so a flat head wide fontanelles, a prominent forehead, which you can see, hypertelorism, so the eyes are wide spaced, flexion contractures, and in some cases, congenital glaucoma. So this is a consanguineous case. There's a uh, uh, first cousin mating here. Here's the proband. Proband was mapped by autozygosity mapping and sequenced and had a mutation in the gene that I just mentioned to you, myosin binding protein, C2. So Eric's going to pick up the story here and tell you how we proceed using that as one example, summarizing the advantages of the zebrafish system. Thank you, Dick. So um, as uh, we did already mentioned last time we met at the kickoff meeting, you know, zebrafish investigators and zebrafish geneticists are rapidly becoming best friends with human geneticists, both because of the advances in human genetics and increasing cases feeding the pipeline where functional annotation and also uh, causality have to be established. Mm -hmm. Also, what's going on in the zebrafish community, where advances in genome editing has really made this even more tractable uh, model, so, so that um, we're able to, uh, in the zebrafish uh, system, figure out the homologs for the human genes and very quickly gain gene expression data, many of much of which is already deposited on ZFIN. And if, if even if it's not, we can do whole uh, embryo in situ very rapidly on the order of days. And functionally, we can generate a CRISPR. Uh, mutants uh, on, in the order of months, and we can uh, not only uh, CRISPR uh, the genes in question, but sometimes even genes uh, that are in the pathway. And also, we can uh, work on the wealth of mutants that already exist in the zebrafish community uh, that we can order, both from ENU mutagenesis uh, projects as well as retroviral uh, insertional projects, so that we can gain uh, functional uh, assays uh, rapidly. And that's sort of where we draw the line for the purpose of uh, face space, is to rapidly establish causality for human candidate genes, and also to do the first order uh, phenotype analysis for the gene uh, function annotation. Beyond that, for mechanism and pathway, uh, either through uh, pathways that emerge from uh, additional genes being uh, annotated or from the work that we will all do together to figure out gene networks. But for uh, the purpose of this project, this is sort of where we draw the line. So uh, we uh, also benefit from the wisdom of the first face-based project, first base, face -based project where uh, uh, investigators in zebrafish community uh, such as Chuck uh, 
and others have already very, done very nice detailed anatomic work establishing the uh, facial, craniofacial development in the early embryo. And now with uh, Shannon and Matt, uh, and the, the beautiful images we saw this morning, correlating that to the larval and adult stages to make this model even more robust uh, from a morphogenesis uh, standpoint. And most of you uh, know the advantages of the zebrafish mo model. We can make transgenics very rapidly uh, to generate reporters or to generate um, uh, expression gain of function studies. Uh, as already mentioned, the robust mutagenesis project, there's a wealth of, uh, un and this is ongoing, so increasingly uh, robust um, uh, libraries of mutants that we can call upon. Uh, when we have a human candidate gene uh, that, that we're interested in. We can now do target immunogenesis in a very rapid and specific, efficient manner. So that's really, really revolutionized the field. Uh, no longer will, be, will we be wary of the morpholino data and, and toxicity concerns. Here we'll be able to generate the mutant. And that's now rapidly becoming the standard of, um, uh, of um, uh, analysis, definitely for our lab and for the community. And now, more recently, we can now also do knock-ins. And in the case of most human generic, of uh, human uh, genome experiments, it's the gene variant that you're interested in. Now we can model that more specifically with the knock-in technology. And uh, also, many times human geneticists are forced to find a zebrafish investigator down the hall. You know, who may, may or may not be uh, someone who has the resources and interest even to study craniofacial anomalies. Here, we're, this is our vested interest. So if you have a gene uh, from a human study, we will be very interested in it. We can immediately do the expression analysis if it's not already published. And we can, we're set up to do very detailed uh, uh, analysis from the, for the phenotype. These are just some examples. We can look at conversion extension of the palate. Here are the maxillary prominences in green. In red is the frontal nasal process. We can look at directional uh, proliferation of the palate here as an example. We also have now the zebra bow a multispectral uh, analysis uh, working pretty well. So we can even look at clonal analysis and look at intercalation in the live uh, imaging uh, in the live embryo. So these are some examples we've done already with SPEC1L, CAPZB, and ATP4C. SPEC1L came from a case of, of, of the first case uh, where genetic basis for uh, test CA or oblique facial cleft ha has been established. CAPZB is a patient with a cleft palate with hypotonia and a retrusive uh, lower jaw, almost like a Roban sequence, uh, who, which we also have successfully modeled in the zebrafish. ATG4C also is a patient that presented with cleft uh, palate, and which we have then gone, gone on to, to establish that uh, many of the genes in the autophagy pathway may actually intersect with um, uh, craniofacial dysmorphosis. And here are the examples uh, that Dick already mentioned that came from Falzan. <coughs> And uh, here's the one case that we'll go into more detail. Just to, uh, we have to talk about the gene name and the candidates is just as an example to illustrate the power of the system and how this will work out. So here's a gene, the human gene, a candidate gene right now is MIT-C2. This is myosin binding protein C2. This, in the literature, the most well studied is actually the myosin binding protein C3. That's a cardiac specific myosin binding protein when uh, mutating in human causes uh, cardiomyopathy, both hypertrophic as well as dilated cardiomyopathy. But myosin binding C2, there's no human mutation described and then a mouse uh, a mutant has not been described. So in the zebrafish, Sure enough, if we call up the Z-fin, expression pattern already exists. And in fact, in great enough detail, we can make out all the staining happens to be in this day four embryo's craniofacial uh, saddle skeleton. And these are actually the pectoral muscles um, of the fish, make, which makes sense because it's expected to be in the skeletal muscles. And taking advantage of the wealth of mutants that already exist, there's already a mutant. In fact, it's a very good one. It's a retroviral transgene, a tag mutant. And these have a, a very high rate of being a good mutant for subsequent studies. And uh, as you notice, I wrote down two genes. So for zebrafish, there are two homologs due to genome duplication scenario of the zebrafish genome. So there's a mutant already for the 2A homolog. So we can very rapidly generate the 2B on the CRISPR. In fact, we can generate CRISPR injecting into the transgenic and immediately to make the double knockout. And this is what we were alluding to, that as we start to annotate, annotate genes one by one, the, the, the pictures start to emerge where, at least in the case of SPEC1L and CAPZB, these are several skeletal proteins, SPEC1L being a, a scaffolding protein with three CCD uh, coil, coil, coil binding domains and a complexion homology domain that then associates with filamentous actin. CAPZB is a capping protein for the, for the expanding actin. And in fact, the myosin 
PBBC2 has domains that interact with uh, Actin directly. So I'll turn over to Dick again to wrap up. So uh, time's almost up, but I uh, wanted to just uh, mention that uh, this is the approach, as Eric just illustrated, that we hope to apply to many of these uh, human uh, candidate genes. And uh, uh, Eric's excellent work, it, it should go fairly quickly. Um, so in thinking about how we can interact with other components of face space, uh, it seems as though there's lots of potential opportunities, and although we haven't really interacted with hardly anyone so far, hopefully that'll change soon. Um, so I already mentioned that we're going to rely on uh, some of you to generate patients that we can analyze, uh, both by sequence analysis and hopefully if we find the right gene by uh, modeling in, in fish or mouse. So that would be, for example, Pedro or Ophir or anyone else who has uh, access to clinical craniofacial dysmorphosis patients. Um, so that's here and uh, over here. Uh, of course, we will interact with the hub by depositing the sequence data and the metadata that goes with it. Um, we've talked about how that will be protected. Um, we would hope certainly to be able to use the expression data that Mimi will generate for craniosynostosis and that Trevor will generate because one of the filters that you can apply to a list of sequence variants in genomic DNA is is the candidate gene uh, actually expressed in the right part of the craniofacial complex? And so that would be very helpful. Um, we also uh, would like to be able to um, use the zebrafish models that uh, Shannon and Matt have been working on. And uh, presumably we will also be interacting with uh, uh, the ontolo ontogeny, uh, ontology uh, uh, program. So I think we'll stop there. I just want to acknowledge that we have excellent computational help supporting this effort uh, at BWH. This is Eric's group at MGH working on the zebrafish component of the program. Alzan's uh, very able uh, team has been absolutely instrumental in generating this most recent set of uh, candidate genes. And of course, the work is supported uh, by the face space uh, program. So I'll stop there. Questions? So you mentioned in one of your patients, if I'm correct, uh, the Moffat Wilson syndrome, that ZEP2 is the mutated gene. Yeah. So do you have a fish model for this mutation or the, in zebrafish or, and also a mouse model, maybe? Well, and you said you want to interact yeah. with some of us. So, so the I question was one. about <laughs> <laughs> Because ZEP2 is downstream of our PDA. I see. That's, that's uh, good to know. The, uh, so the question is about ZEP2. Yeah. Uh, it's a zinc finger binding protein. Um, I should say for ZEB2, we weren't the first to find that in Moet Wilson syndrome. That was actually known. We found an interesting patient. Uh, what we do have is an interesting mouse model uh, from a conditional deletion in craniofacial uh, epithelium. And it uh, has a very, in Moet Wilson syndrome, one of the defining features is a uh, mandibular pronathism. Uh, it's actually, Eric would refer to it as a class three malocclusion. And the mice actually have that same phenotype. They have a very pointy chin. So uh, it's a nice model because you can dissect the proliferation relates in maxilla and mandible. And what you find is that uh, contrary to what you might have thought, which would be a hyperproliferation of the mandibular mes uh, mesenchyme, you see a uh, inhibition of proliferation of both maxilla and mandibular mesenchyme, but that the maxilla is more retarded than the mandible, which gives us very abnormal facial appearance. So ZEP2 is a, I don't know if we have a zebrafish mutant for that yet. Um, it is expressed um, it's in the BMP signaling pathway, as you might know. And so our working hypothesis has been to look to that interaction as a way to explain this effect. Um, but be very interested to hear more about. Uh, so it's expressed in the ectoderm. Ectoderm. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Rich. So while we're on the topic of ZEB2, when you mentioned it, I looked it up in the GR GWAS data set, and it comes up as sort of a medium hit. Um, but unfortunately, we weren't able to design a good replication assay for it that passed PC. And so I'm not sure it even went into the replication study, or if it did, it probably didn't work just looking at the design scores. Um, but it has to do with uh, measure, linear measurements around the mouth. So that would fit. Um, but with respect to our face-based 2 project, um, 
we're not collecting DNA and we're really um, going for knowns. We see unknowns, but we generally don't image them. Yeah, so that was a question <coughs> we talked about briefly at the last meeting. Uh, yeah, sorry. So Rich asked about the, uh, during his talk, he mentioned that uh, you had initially started out looking for, uh, the plan was to do genetic analysis and uh, morphometry. But as time went on, it became uh, focused on morphometry. Some of these patients have already been diagnosed. And no, no, that's not quite true. So okay. I mean, this is the database that we're building and that we're using for morphometrics are unknowns. We were never intending to do unknowns. A lot of people want to give us unknowns, but we're actually excluding them at this point. So whereas you're looking for unknowns, so we would actually have so, to talk about whether we could expand to collect them. But what, we're also what our conversation would be, is there a way to integrate what we're interested in with what you're doing? I'm not so sure. But I do know that Ophir has independent patients that he's uh, going to send us. Well, we, I mean, everybody does. Yep. It's a way to, to funnel them to you, right? Mm -hmm. So the concept that I was thinking is our unknowns become knowns. And you know, with Moat Wilson, we have a, a lot of ones that are recognized, 3D meshes. And if we discover that it's Moat Wilson and have a 3D mesh, it'll go to you, uh, Rich, as a known, mm -hmm. a post hoc known. Sure. If you're doing molecular testing on it, or? I personally won't, but maybe uh, Dick might. So that's how it, it could potentially work. Sure. We're, we're, we are trying to exclude cases where the gene is likely to be a kind of remutation, but obviously many of these disorders are genetically heterogeneous, so. Right, so he's not interested in sequencing Moat Wilson cases. No. No. And well, we are we are interested in the ones that now are Zeb two negative. Sure. 